The number you have dialed has been changed. The new number is... Please note, the new number is... So welcome to the Naked Dialog Podcast, Sarah. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, first of all, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing fine, doing fine. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, Schrodinger, uh, who is known for Schrodinger's cat, um, which is like superposition in physics, um, delivered a lecture back in 1943 at the Dublin Institute about what is life. And he talked about the need for a new type of physical law uh, in order to define uh, the origin of life. And I was wondering uh, whether you know or have hypothesized about like this need for a new type of physical law to define the origin of life. Yeah, um, I think I've thought about that like my whole career. So I think it's a great question. Um, and certainly when there's not an easy answer to. So I think Schrodinger had something really particular in mind, um, although it's, it's difficult to say, but he was thinking mostly about non-equilibrium thermodynamics and the fact that whatever would explain life would have to be beyond sort of our standard descriptions of what we understand in thermodynamics. Um, And when I'm thinking, I also make a lot of arguments that we need new physics to describe life, Um, but I think it's sort of beyond statistical mechanics and we might might need to reformulate the way that we think about thermodynamics and statistical mechanics when we get to living systems. So I don't work from the premise of trying to expand uh, current theories of physics, um, like thermodynamics, or some people think, you know, there's quantum biology, or, you know, like we have all these existing theories of physics that work pretty well in the domains they were developed. Um, I don't see any reason that those theories should directly apply to life. Um, and so, and they don't seem to apply very well. So, um, a lot of what I've been working on is really thinking more about causation being fundamental. Um, and how do we actually think about the fact that life seems to do something different? with the concepts we call information and causation than we see in other areas of physics. And can we build a physics that actually starts from those features being the things that you ultimately want to describe? And does, is that, does that physics naturally account for life? And then how does that physics actually map back to our other physical theories? Um, and so that's really sort of the approach I have to the problem. People don't have a problem with, I mean, they do have a problem with quantum mechanics and general relativity being developed independently, and now they need to be unified. But I think people have just assumed current theories will apply to life without thinking that it's its own domain of physics and it needs its own explanation. So I agree with him. <laughs> yeah. So uh, like talking about like a unified theory, um, I saw one of your TED Talks where you I think take the components of math, art, and information for like a yeah. unified theory for origin of life. Um, are there any more components that you may or may not include in that? And like, if you do include math and art and information, how does that tie up in, in defining the origin of life? Um, yeah, so I think actually what I'm after, if I state it most simply, is a unified explanation that's abstract enough to explain everything about life, which doesn't explain everything. Obviously, you lose a lot of the details, but the idea is we don't know what universal properties apply to all things that are in the quote unquote category that we call life. Um, And so part of the reason I structured uh, that particular talk the way I did was I was trying to point out that a lot of the features that we do as biological systems like create art or invent mathematics are actually still part of the same deep abstract principles about how the universe works. It's about creativity in the physical world and how those things that get created in the world actually affect what happens in the future. Um, So that's again about this sort of causal picture. So um, when I'm thinking sort of that abstractly about the nature of life, pretty much everything in our biosphere is part of life from the technology we generate to the art um, we hang on our wall to the art we wear in our fashion. It's all part of, you know, part of that structure. Um, and I think that's probably one of the things that um, uh, when you're talking about information, it's a pretty abstract concept. Um, and, and yeah, so, so that's kind of, uh, I don't really have a hard boundary on sort of this is life, this is not life. And I think that's kind of one of the major conceptual breakthroughs that we need to get through because people have traditionally thought, you know, there, there's something called life and there's something that's not life. And it's a very, you know, hard boundary, black, white categorization of nature. And what I'm trying to make the argument is that there's these missing principles that are universal. They apply to everything that exists in the universe. They're just much more apparent in the things that we call life. 
Um, and they're very apparent in the things we call technology or human creative activities. That's very interesting, especially when you talk about art. So I was like wondering how does like art kind of relate to information and entropy? Um, because I saw one of your examples, which was like Mona yeah. Lisa, which was very interesting. So it made me think, you know, how does art relate to information and like moreover entropy in general? Uh, yeah, I mean, people say art is in the eye of the pole holder, right? So that, um, so that automatically implies that you have like art is a communication channel, right? So you have a sender who's the artist and a receiver who's the person appreciating the art. And they have to have some common conception of what they appreciate as being beautiful or stimulating some emotion or evocative response. So, um, so from that perspective, you could actually think of art as in a sort of concrete, you know, Shannon information-esque media as a channel <laughs> between two um, communicators. Um, so in that sense, it's art, but I, I was actually meaning something a little bit differently. Um, uh, so um, also, which I think is an important feature. So I always wonder about like scientific creativity. And for me, I don't think the creative process that scientists undergo is all that different than the artistic creative process or any other creative process that humans do. It's just that it has a different relationship with how it feeds back with reality than say art does. Um, and so uh, when you're thinking, so, and this is, has become sort of my obsession with mathematics because a lot of people think mathematics is interesting because it describes the world so well. And I think that's really true. And there's this really sort of um, deep uh, feature that we don't understand well, which is why our minds are structured to comprehend reality in such a way that we can write down simple mathematical laws and they actually correspond to reality. Um, and I think that feature is actually a really um, concise window into the physics that describes what we are um, in the sense that, um, you know, our minds are um, sort of building <laughs> maps of the regularities in the causal structure of the universe and then using those to actually mediate new transformations that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And I think artists do that too, but I think they just do it at a different level. It's not at the level of like atomic physics or something like a quantum physicist might be manipulating, <laughs> you know, something in their experiments that's like, you know, at a base level of reality. Artists are doing that at like a social level. And that's, the, so I think the processes are kind of fundamentally very similar. They're just happening in very different ways. Um, so I guess those are sort of two, two connections that I was making. There's a lot more you can make. I mean, this could be like an hours long, hours. Of, I, I haven't even thought in like, I love this sort of analogy, but I haven't even thought about it as much depth as I would like to, because I think it's so rich um, to think about the parallels between these things. It's actually very interesting to think that um, the essence of living um, systems is kind of informational in nature. I was wondering like, how does this essence uh, relate to let's say the Darwinian evolution theory? Yeah, um, so I think it's consistent with Darwin. I think Darwin was, I, I mean, people do appreciate him as a deep thinker, but I think he was, he was exceptionally deep thinker. Um, and, you know, some people have argued that like Darwin's laws should really be like laws of physics <laughs> themselves. But I think the problem is we don't see how um, it's not the way he formulated uh, evolutionary theory isn't sufficiently general to apply to the non living universe right and if you want to describe the origin of life you need a theory that re reproduces what Darwin saw and Darwin described but also describes non living things because you actually want to be able to talk about the transition to <laughs> you know evolution as we see it in a biosphere. Um, so I think a lot of the ideas that we're looking at are just. Um, you know, they're supposed to be like one level deeper because now we're not just trying to explain how uh, biological things that exist change in time, but we're actually trying to explain how they emerge in the first place and how other examples might look and which features of their change in time are going to be consistent across many different examples of life. Um, and that gets quite hard. And I don't think sort of current evolutionary theory is generalizable enough to be able to, to solve those problems. I mean, obviously, we haven't solved the origin of life yet. And that's where people usually cite this sort of glaring issue. And, and Darwin himself didn't want to talk about it. He had this great quote where he was like, one might as well talk about the origin of matter uh, rather than talking about the origin of life. But of course, you know, that one's been solved mostly. So, so we can do the origins of life now. Yeah, and I feel like there's so many theories describing the origin of life, um, particularly one um, that I might have come across was this 
RNA world hypothesis, which mm -hmm. confuses me a lot. So I was wondering if you could explain it to me, like what this sure. RNA world it, hypothesis it actually, is. Yeah, it confuses me a lot too. And I think it's more of a pragmatic hypothesis than one that's actually testable. Um, and so the history of that is, uh, so RNA is short for ribonucleic acid, which is a, um, a kind of a genetic polymer that we have in our bodies and, and all organisms on earth pretty much have it. Um, and um, so uh, it encodes genetic information. So in modern systems, it acts as an intermediary between DNA and production of proteins. And it also has some other functional roles in the cell and can perform catalysis. So because it's, it acts as a genetic polymer, it can store genetic information the same way DNA can, but it also can um, catalyze reactions and it plays this intermediary role between DNA and proteins. People thought, well, a natural hypothesis is that RNA preceded DNA and proteins. Um, and so that's sort of the central thesis of the RNA world hypothesis. Um, but there's sort of extreme variations of it. One of them is just the earliest ancestor of modern life on earth used RNA as its genetic material. And then there's sort of this other extreme end, which is RNA was the very first thing made from abiotic chemistry on the early earth. And somehow it, um, you know, the reactions were just right for it to form polymers and those polymers started uh, copying themselves and then they started evolving. Um, polymers are just chains of uh, individual small molecules, the monomers. Um, and so, um, so then once you get that copying process, then people imagine you have Darwinian evolution happening and therefore uh, evolution does the rest and complexity emerges for free. Um, so there's a couple problems. Um, one of them is the complexity emerges for free issue because if you take um, even say an RNA virus and you evolve it in the lab, there's this famous experiment called Spiegelman's monster. Um, replication, like just, just selecting on something, copying itself actually shortens the sequences because it's easier to copy shorter things. So they actually decrease in complexity over time. Uh, so there's a big issue of how do you actually take this RNA polymer and um, you know, evolve something very complex. But I think the, the other issue is how much information are you actually, which is not really as readily discussed, so Spiegelman's monster people are aware of, um, is how much information are you actually putting in to those experiments that you're trying to do to validate the RNA world? So um, people like the RNA world, and it was a very popular hypothesis early on in origins of life research because it's easy to do experiments because you actually can put the molecules in a test tube, you can do selection experiments on them, or you can try to figure out how to make the individual molecules of RNA. And that's a very tractable research exercise. And then that took, you know, like you can do that on the time scale of a PhD, someone can make a base in RNA, et cetera. So people took that and then a lot of people started working on it because it was easy to do. And then it became this sort of dominant paradigm in origins of life without people thinking too much about what are the implications for the nature of life? How likely is this actually to happen spontaneously? And there are a lot of arguments people say, well, we put prebiotic conditions, conditions of early earth in our experiments, therefore it works. Um, you know, it, it can plausibly happen on a prebiotic earth. But what they're not doing is they're not saying, they're not, not um, you know, specifying they had pure reagents, they changed the pH at this time step, they put this much UV light in at this time step, and they did, you know, X, Y, Z here, here, and here, and they got a pure product, or not a pure product, but they at least got something in high yield. Um, but each of those steps you do is now a biological agent intervening on the physical world, <laughs> changing an outcome, which is what life does. So they've put life in by hand because they put information into the experiment. So that experiment is actually not decoupled from our biology because it has information from our biology, basically setting all the boundary constraints. Um, and this is sort of a subtle thing, I think that people don't, so when you take this informational perspective on life, life is not uh, individuals. It's not you and me as separate bounded structures, we're life. It's a continuum of processes that started with the original life and have basically been propagating information across space and time for three and a half billion years. And so the things that we generate, like our technology, our pens, our computers that we're talking on now are all products of life. Our experiments are products of life. They're life themselves. Um, and so it doesn't mean it's impossible to do an original life experiment, but it means that we need to be really careful and we need to account for how much information we put in so we know what the universe is actually generating within the physical constraints of that experiment on its own 
so that we can actually say this is a process that can happen spontaneously in the universe without our help. Because um, we're just not thinking of ourselves as physical systems when we're de designing these experiments. So that's my long-winded answer on what the RNA world is, but I have to <laughs> state why I have problems with it too. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh yeah, you can you can state the problems as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, so I read some of your work, and I feel like you utilize this um, Boolean network uh, model yeah. and and also information theory to try to decipher the origin of life. I was wondering what these two are, first of all, and like how do they how they might attempt to let's say um, decipher the origin of life. Yeah. So. Um... So this is a great question. Um, and I think this has a lot to do with actually like the scientific process itself and also the creative process of being a scientist trying to come up with like new ideas about how things work. Um, so early in my career, um, you know, I was really challenged as a postdoc when I came to ASU by my mentor, Paul Davies. You know, it's not like everybody sits down with like their mentor when they show up on day one for a postdoc fellowship and they're like, you know, if there was one problem that had to be solved in the origin of life, what would it be? Can you just identify the one like sort of simple idea that we need to work on? And that ended up dominating most of my postdoc work was actually doing more philosophy than anything else in some sense that I was really trying to think conceptually about things. So I came, came up with Paul of this idea that life somehow had to be this transition. The origin of life is a transition to this sort of, I, I talk about it as new physics that becomes dominant in, in systems that we call alive that has to do with causation and information. But that's all very abstract, right? Like those are words, they kind of mean something, but how do you actually turn that into a concrete theory? And, um, and so uh, we published a paper with that idea almost 10 years ago. And I think I've spent like the last 10 years trying to figure out exactly what we meant in that paper, you know, in terms of a way that like you could build a theory that was testable. Um, and so some of the early tools I was using were um, information theory um, and Boolean networks. Um, and um, so the information theory part is because we have some sense that life uses um, information and abstractions um, and that those somehow are causal. And there's a whole set of debates about what does causation mean? How can you say they're causal? If physics tells us the, you know, like the universe is causally closed at the micro scale, so we don't have room for high level causes, all these kind of things that people get into debates about. But let's just assume that's like a premise that works. You, you still have to talk about information. What is information? And there's, you know, there's a theory that was developed in the 1940s by Claude Shannon, and, you know, kind of has exploded um, in terms of its popularity and utility which is information theory, where information is defined as sort of an entropy-esque measure about like the degree of surprise you might feel if you like encounter a particular something in, in, in the world. But actually, um, I think, uh, you know, the real sort of measure of information there is something called mutual information, which is if you have, if like we're going back to that art example we were talking about earlier, you have a sender and receiver, they can have high mutual information if they they had some pre-existing sort of um, uh, communication, like they have, they have some correlations in their system. Um, so, um, so I don't want to get into details and explain that too much because I think um, what's more interesting to me is that there's sort of a lot of problems with Shannon information when you apply it to biology. When it's not uh, the the canonical things people talk about is it doesn't account for meaning. Um, and biological information is meaningful information. So, for example, you might say me talking right now is conveying information. <laughs> Shannon's theory would say nothing about the meaning of the words. It would say something about the structure of the syntax of like the arrangement of the letters in the words that I'm saying. Um, and so that doesn't seem to actually capture anything interesting <laughs> about what I'm saying. Um, and so, so people have had debates about that for a long time. But I think for me, part of the problem was um, it's not it's it sort of exists at this sort of level where the observer is describing the system and already kind of knows things ahead of time and then you can talk about Shannon information it doesn't feel like it's intrinsic to the physics itself it's it's a little bit like statistical mechanics works pretty well because you can label you know the states of the world and then you can talk about properties of them but you're not actually talking about how those um, mechanisms are embedded in the physical structure of the system um, so so there were some problems with that. Um, and then the Boolean networks, I was working on those because um, they have sort of, well, first off, Boolean logic is also sort of an important development of, um, you know, the last uh, 100 years, um, or actually, I don't know when 
school actually wrote those down. But anyway, like it became really important in circuitry and things like that. Um, so, um, so the idea there is, is, you know, you can think about it as like a, a nice way of talking about computation because you have zeros and ones and you can talk about changing the states of the zeros and ones in your system. And, um, and that allows you to talk about, say, um, you know, an AND gate or an OR gate or stringing them together and performing certain computations. So, um, so where we were using it is studying something called gene networks because you can actually model the interaction of genes in a Boolean network in the sense that a gene is either present or not, it's expressed or not in the biological cell, and therefore it has a state zero or one. And then you can say, um, and then you can try to study um, you know, do the dynamics of genes if I coarse grain them in this way? Obviously, you know they have like sort of, well they have, they have a set of values that are not just they're there or they're not there, right? It's like more of a gradation of states, but you just cut it off and you decide they're either there above this threshold or not, and then you study the dynamics of the patterns of gene expression. You can actually fit a lot of those um, uh, systems to a Boolean network model, at least for small gene networks. So we wanted to study. Uh, those as the window into how our gene networks processing information in the Shannon sense, and also does that allow us to understand features of computation in living systems, and and how do we use that to kind of get at some of these deeper ideas about information and causal structure? Because a Boolean network is in some sense the causal structure of the interaction patterns between genes. So, um, so I was doing that kind of stuff for a while. I don't work on either of those things really much anymore. My group still does a little bit of information theory and we use some stuff with Boolean networks. But part of the reason is because they're, so, so the whole idea of that was to understand this concept of the origin life transition as this transition in causal structure and information processing. But the more you dig into that problem, the more you realize you can't shoehorn current concepts into fitting all the things that are, that are happening there and what really needs to be explained. Um, and so the other thing I played around for with for a while that maybe it explains it a little bit better is this idea that um, the laws of nature depend on the states of the system. And so, um, so in physics, um, and this really is sort of a legacy of Newton, um, because he formulated physics this way and everybody has subsequent to him, um, you, you define sort of a fixed law of nature and it's timeless, it exists in some sense outside the universe because it's not defined in time. And then it, once you specify the initial condition for that rule, you just evolve your universe forward in time and it, it pretty much describes it for all time. And this is one of the reasons that people think that microstates, you know, the lower level descriptions of reality are causally closed and there's no reason for, no um, ability for causation at higher levels because we have the law, we have the initial condition, that's all the explanation you need. But of course, they don't really ask the question, where do the laws come from? Who put them there? <laughs> Why are they there? <laughs> and not realizing that there are effective descriptions of what's happening in the world and they only exist in our minds. So then you have to start asking questions about, um, well, <laughs> where do you go from there? Um, and one of the places where people see this being challenged the most is actually in studying biological systems. Because if you look at life, and this is something Darwin saw, um, it looks like the rules change in time. Right. He's got this great quote, you know, like a, about whilst the, um, you know, the planets keep moving by the fixed law of motion endless forms most wonderful continue to be evolved. Right. So he's talking about the fact that things are changing over time in the biological world in a way that's not changing in time in the Newtonian world. Um, and um, and so a lot of people have talked about this idea that there might be laws that are a function of the actual state of the system or rules. So. Um, you know, my behavior changes based on my mood. Um, or I'm using very anthropocentric examples, but you can think even in a cell, um, you know, how the cell is functioning depends on the pattern of gene expression. And that changes as a function of, uh, you know, the internal workings of the cell. So the cell is actually a state dependent machine in some sense, so people have described it that way. Um, so all of this is to say that that kind of description of reality doesn't really mesh up with the way we do physics. And I was playing around um, at the same time with these Boolean network models of gene networks also with cellular automata trying to explore if you had state dependent cellular automata instead of fixed rules in a cellular automata how would that change things um, and of course it changes a lot but i'm still shoehorning uh, new concepts into old physics because all these paradigms are built on these sort of old sets of ideas 
Um, and so, so where we've come around to things now is I'm, I'm working on um, this theory called assembly theory with uh, Lee Cronin's lab in Glasgow, which is meant to capture the causal structure of objects that exist and talk about features of those causal structures and how they interact with each other to generate what happens in the universe and how that becomes related to living systems. And it has elements of all of those things I'm talking about, but it's broken sort of the paradigm of some of the constraints that I experienced in studying those systems. Um, and, and it's been sort of a long progression of going through different toy models to realize that we really like, what are the features that work and don't work about all these things that people have tried to use in the past. Um, and so that's where I am now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, it's always very interesting to listen to you and Professor Lee Cronin on Clubhouse, by the way. Um, yeah. and, uh, I, was, I was also wondering, because I was, um, of course, going through your work, um, and there was this uh, keyword, and I'm probably going to butcher pronouncing it, um, homosexuality, something like that? Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, would you explain what that is and like how you're yeah. working on the origin yeah. of that? Yeah. So it's, um, it's homochirality and chiral means hand, I guess, in Latin. Um, and so, so just like your, your left and right hand come in mirror image forms, that's what like chiral is supposed to indicate that you have objects that can exist in mirror image forms. So a thing like a spoon is an achiral object because you know, it's, it's, it's mirror image, but uh, a hand is not its mirror image, right? I can't superimpose my hands over each other because there's an issue there. Um, you know, my thumbs won't overlap. Um, so this is actually really relevant to molecules because molecules have 3D structure and some molecules are chiral and some molecules are not chiral. And it turns out that chiral molecules play a really interesting role in biology because um, biology is chiral selective. It cares about certain mirror image molecules and not others. Um, so for example, the amino acids that make up the proteins in our body are left-handed and the sugars in DNA and RNA are right-handed. Um, and there are minor variations of uses of the sugar. So there's some left-handed sugars in biology and some right-handed amino acids, but overall that's sort of like the, the global trend. Um, and so this becomes interesting in origins of life discussions because one of the features of life biochemically that people have been interested in explaining is the emergence of this homochirality. Homochirality meaning all one-handedness. So the fact that all amino acids, all 20 um, or so of them, because it, it varies from organism to organism, are, are left-handed. And then, um, you know, all the sugars are right-handed. So that means, yeah. So, um, so you, but if you try to think about like the early earth, no biological systems, and you do some synthesis under some, you know, plausible conditions, again, these sort of prebiotic experiments, uh, feasibly, you should expect to get equal numbers of, of both kinds of molecule, unless you have some selection process that's preferentially choosing one over the other, or you have some kind of symmetry breaking happen. Um, and so this is actually where I got started working on this because I was a PhD student in a cosmology group um, at Dartmouth College um, when I was in graduate school. And symmetry breaking is one of the favorite words of cosmologists. <laughs> They love symmetry breaking, right? So you can think of like matter and antimatter in the early universe, right? We have to explain why the universe has matter and not antimatter, even though they have equivalent properties. So we, we have some symmetry breaking that happened in the early universe. Um, so my PhD advisor was really interested in homochirality because he was like, oh, there's this symmetry breaking at the origin of life too. Let's study that one and see if we can use some of those tools. Um, so this is actually how I started working on origins of life. Um, but I, so, so there's sort of that problem that people are interested in. But I think um, for me, what's much more interesting about chirality nowadays, and I have this project that I'm working on with a few people in my group studying patterns of like statistically. So we do this, this thing we call statistical mechanics of biochemistry, because we're basically looking at all the molecules life uses, um, like small molecules and all of its like meta metabolism, like across the planet and looking for statistical regularities and the properties of the molecules people use as a way to construct um, like in the same sense that in the 1800s, we could build engines that based on thermodynamic principles, we want to build like, you know, a, a equivalent, whatever a biochemical engine is, I, it's not an engine, I, I don't mean in an energy sense, but like, what is the statistical model that describes the features of the chemistry that we see on life on earth that we can then predict what life on other planets will look like. And it turns out when you actually adopt this kind of very macro scale uh, study of biochemistry, chirality has a really interesting role there too. The fact that some molecules have this uh, mirror image orientation and not, and that there's this, like some of them are selected and some of them are not selected. 
Um, and I think it actually, if you're thinking about causation and sort of these deeper principles about life, um, when we talk about assembly spaces, for example, um, assembly is interesting in molecules. It's, it's a general theory, um, but where it's been validated so far is in molecules. So you take a molecule and you break it apart into um, like break it in two pieces, break them in two pieces again, and you build up basically a tree of all the ways of assembling that object. Um, and the assembly index is the minimal path in that space, which is related to how much time, how many steps of precision it takes to make that object in the universe. Um, but we also, in, in sort of the way I think about what we're doing with assembly theory and where we're going, I think about the universe as an assembly space. So there's every object that exists, like you and I, are assembly spaces, right? We have all this causal structure encoding all the possible histories of our formation. Um, and also the way that we interact with other things could be defined by that causal structure, right? And then if you think about chirality as a shape in that space, there's an orientation that actually is, it's an orientation in time about a directionality for the way the futures and past could go in sort of two mirror image universes. Um, and so chirality is actually kind of imposing something interesting on the causal structure of the way that these systems actually interact with each other in a really interesting way. And that's actually what I'm interested in now in exploring about chirality, but that's not an idea that's really in the literature in the sort of deeper fundamental way. Um, and certainly not in sort of the way I was writing about homo chirality when I first started as a grad student. Um, but I think it's actually like, it's trying to bring it into sort of this new physics that we're trying to uncover. Um, because I think the point, like the, the hard problem is you, when you're constructing new theories, like we're trying to do about the origins of life and the nature of life, you have to start at sort of all the ideas that exist, or at least this is how I've done it. Like all the ideas that people exist, you read the literature, you read the ideas, you read the holes, you start thinking about them, you get to this level and you think about sort of the abstraction that might connect some of them, you play around with it, you get to this level, and then you get to this thing that's really deep and seems all encompassing of all those ideas. And then you have to crawl your way back up, trying to validate how it connects to each one of them. And I'm in that crawling phase now. So it's gonna take a lot to connect the dots, but I think it's super cool um, because there is a lot of potential for trying to explain a lot of these features that have just been kind of stuck on, you know, in different places. Like the RNA world is talked about as a separate hypothesis from homo chirality. And sometimes people talk about them together, but not very often. So all of these origin of life ideas are, are just this disconnected map, but they should be unified by some deep idea about the nature of life and why these properties arose with it. Oh yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, also, because you think like a cosmologist, right? So, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> like to draw like a very abstract comparison. So, like um, you know how John, so Sartre, um, who was an existentialist philosopher, uh, he and being and nothingness tried to define what it means to exist by mm -hmm. trying to understand what it means not to exist. So, in that relation, um, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, uh, and this might be a very abstract comparison. How, how would you, like as a cosmologist, uh, differentiate between a non-living world and a living world? Um, interesting. Um, in the context of what it is to exist and not to exist. Um, so I think, um, so I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll uh, I love this question. This is great. Um, I'm like, I'm trying to figure out like where's the best place to penetrate it because there's a lot of ideas. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I guess the easiest one is like, I sometimes think about um, like the physics of life as the physics of existence. So if you yeah. ask questions about why does this thing exist and not this thing, of course, um, both of them exist as like ideas, right? So like, you can't even think of a thing that doesn't have some existence to it because you're giving existence to it by thinking about it. So I've always thought that was a little paradoxical, but also kind of a clue. Um, and so, um, so I guess um, what I mean is, um, uh, you know, the universe exists and we exist in the universe. And then what gets to exist in my mind is determined by the things that exist now um, in this moment. Um, and, um, and how those features are determined is very perplexing um, and a very um, interesting. So I, I don't think, um, let's see, I don't think uh, I would distinguish between the non-living universe and the living universe in terms of this ability of the things that exist to generate more existence. I think that's just, the, that's actually the, the general feature. Like when I talk about information and causation, it's also that thing. It's the fact that I don't, I don't want laws outside of the universe. The fact that 
um, you know, certain things um, interact the same way every time and produce the same outcomes every time is just, you know, some of the interactions that exist in the universe have very low memory and they're very reproducible. And then there are some laws that are super local to objects like you or I, and those interactions will never be produced in another object that exists ever. Um, but electrons will reproduce the same things over and over again. But then we, we ascribe that as a universal law that exists outside of electrons as objects, which is really weird. Um, you know, like the laws of electromagnetism or something. Um, so, um, so there's, um, so, so that's sort of the base level. And then I think something that life does, what we would call life, right, um, that does that's a little bit different um, is there's much, uh, so you think again about, like, it's easier for me to articulate in these assembly spaces. When you get to things that have high assembly, they have so much um, causal structure in them that like a lot of it is not, um, you're not directly interacting with a lot of it, um, right? Like if you think about even your, your conscious and your subconscious, right? Like people, people always think that your subconscious is different than your conscious. I, I actually like, I don't like in your subconscious is somehow not you. I don't really understand that view because I, I know how much activity happens in my subconscious. And then like, you know, it bubbles up to my consciousness and like, okay, I'm not aware of it, but it doesn't mean it's not me. Um, and I, I guess what I'm saying with this particular example is um, all of that is part of the, the causal structure of my mind. Um, and um, in a molecule, a molecule has, a, you know, this sort of assembly causal structure. And some features of that are relevant to interactions happening in the universe right now. And some of them, uh, some of that space is not. So in some sense, some of that space doesn't physically exist, but it doesn't mean it won't impact something in the future. Um, or it might not be a model for the future. Um, so, um, so I, I guess what I'm, I'm, this is such a, a difficult set of questions. I guess what I'm trying to think through right now is there are parts of systems that interact with the rest of the physical world, and we would call those existing, but there are other parts that might not directly physically interact, and those seem like they don't exist because you can't measure them, you can't observe them, but it doesn't mean they're not part of the causal structure of the things that exist, which is one of the reasons I think imagination and things actually have causal consequences in the future, because they are there, <laughs> and they do exist, but they're not, they don't exist in the way we think they do. Um, uh, I'm not being very articulate here, I'm sorry, this is uh, you know, you're hitting on like something that I'm thinking about like a lot right now. So it's like in this sort of space of my brain where I'm reassembling ideas. So, um, but it's good. Um, so, um, so I think if I, so I, I guess um, part of the reason it's hard for me to articulate right now is because I'm trying to map this to so, sort of to the theory that we're working on. But I think the key idea that I want to articulate is um, non-living universe, low memory, <laughs> um, you know, and, and things are very easily repeatable. When you get to biology, you start to have memory in the system. So there's a longer causal history to create those objects. Um, and that memory actually matters to what happens subsequently. And then when you get to um, things that are intelligent like us and have internal representation or consciousness or things like that, um, you start to have structure there about things that haven't even existed in the past of the universe. So biology retains the past of the universe and carries it into the future. but I think there's something very particular about imagination and the existence of imagination and the fact that our brains seem to have an architecture that can access things that have never existed and in that process actually make them exist. <laughs> like I like to use the example of rockets, like we thought about rockets for hundreds of years before we built them. Um, and, and science is really good at doing that, but that goes back to the, the science art discussion because I think art is also accessing some parts of that physics. Whatever that no, is. Imagination is definitely a very interesting aspect because um, it also connect back, uh, connects back to Sartre. Um, yeah. Because like he, so he in his book, Imaginary, uh, The Imaginary, talks about how, um, let's say if this is an object, um, it yeah. belongs to the external uh, physical material reality. So it is basically my imagination, which is rendering the image of this object. But this object is distinct from what my perception of it actually really is, and and so most of uh, I would say neuroscientists these days are you know uh, coming up with theories to define or solve the hard problem of consciousness using okay. sensory modalities or let's say perceptual consciousness. Um, so I was wondering like what do you what do you think about like that? Because like if there is an external material physical reality which is uh, inaccessible to us then what is producing this uh, subjective qualia 
um is it our perception or like is it something else um no i think i i i well i think that's a really tough question i think i'm trying to think about that in terms of how we think about assembly and like what is actually interacting and not interacting um but um because we have like like um a virtual space kind of of like you know the things that have never been observed in an assembly space like because if you didn't take a simple molecule i mean um it, it's exponentially huge the space of uh the causal structure of that molecule um you know so there's a, a threshold of like 15 steps you would never expect to observe things um uh, that we identified of, you know, like as the minimal path length. But when, once you get up to that size, the assembly space is absolutely huge, like for a protein or something. So, um, so most of it, you're never going to observe yet. It's an, there are features of that causal space that are observable features of that molecule. Cause we can empirically measure in the lab, uh, the assembly index in a mass spec. So if you think an assembly space as a causal structure of an object is a real physical thing, it does have real physical observables. It's just you can't observe the entire space. Um, and, um, and so I think that feature is actually one of probably the deepest insights of the theory um, and one of the most important ones for thinking about what's next. But as far as like our perception of the world, I think where, where I thought about that um, and sort of the way that I can get the most concrete traction is always to think about mathematics. So most of my thought experiments about what our minds are doing go to math because um, not, not it's probably biased because I'm trained as a theoretical physicist and I'm also romanticized by, um, you know, the sort of uh, famous, you know, incomprehensibility of mathematics and these kind of things. But um, uh, I, I also think it's nice because of the way we talk about mathematics and think about mathematics because we think Mathematics is self-consistent. I mean, obviously, <laughs> there's issues with Gödel theorem and stuff, but um, but it does seem to be like you can take a mathematical statement and you can derive all these consequences from it, and it seems independent of our mind. And then it's this mystery that some of those things actually correspond to the world. Um, and for me, the interesting feature of mathematics is not the fact that we write down laws of nature and they predict features of nature. It's the fact that we write down laws of nature and they change the world we live in. Um, so, right, if you look at, like, from the time that Newton started writing down the laws of gravitation to what's happening on our planet now, I mean, there have been radical transformations because of that change in thought and in the fact that our planet is now uh, poised to reproduce itself on another planet. <laughs> um, if you think about where our technology is going, getting us off world, of course, that wouldn't happen unless we identified something that we call the laws of gravitation and wrote those down. So my point with this is there is a representation in our minds a mathematical law that looks a certain way in our minds and, and the way we think about it. And that, that mathematical law is easily copyable between different physical systems, which is one of the reasons that we think um, it's, um, it's so powerful as a description, but it's also a feature of mathematics as a kind of information because information needs to be copyable. And mathematics is actually, I think, the best example of information we have on our planet. Um, because it is so readily copyable, which is why we think it's so universal. But if you look at that from the outside, like not looking at us, um, you know, it looks really different. It's like these physical systems can now uh, build satellites and launch them into space. But that process doesn't look necessarily like the equations they're using to generate it. I mean, it's, it's a little, um, it's a little weird. Like, I guess my main point is the representations in our mind are accurate to physical reality but they're not accurate in the way that they look inside our mind <laughs> uh, because they're doing something too, right? They're a physical system and a physical process. So I think the, the sort of challenge with um, understanding ourselves is now we have to abstract ourselves outside of ourselves and then say, what is it that our subjective experiences are doing to the physical world? And can we derive a description of what subjective experience does or representations in physical systems do? And, what are the, and, and how do you build a model that includes that as a real feature of the physics? Um, and, and when I think about that, I don't worry so much about like, say the hard problem of consciousness, like what is the exact qualia you're having? Just do you have qualia and do they have causal consequences because you have qualia? Is there a way of meaningfully making that, that statement? Um, I, I think the, the issue of like what you're experiencing right now is by definition, not penetrable to me, right? Because I'm not you. So it's, it doesn't make sense to me as a scientific question. It definitely makes sense to me as a philosophical question. Um, so I think it, it makes sense to ask if, if systems are having it, but not what, what experience they are having. 
but it does make a sense to ask if experience is a real physical thing, what would be the consequences of experiences on the physical world? And in my mind, I think sometimes that you can't even measure that on the scale of a human brain. You might have to measure it on the scale of collectives and how humans evolve over time. Like maybe the evidence that we're all conscious is actually embedded in sort of the historical sequence of events that humanity has undergone over the last few hundred years and will undergo, but you're never gonna be able to prove it in an individual, which is weird. Um, I've also like thought about like two different ways of like let's say navigating through life um, and it mostly comes from like studying philosophy of science and like philosophy in general um, so one way I feel like is a logical mathematical way um, uh, the way Aristotle would talk about it say and the other would be this intuitive way which is like an affective mechanism and I wanted to ask you like as a biologist uh, what do you think about these instincts and drives and intuition and how that comes to, you know, about playing our body and just the way we think about navigating through life and stuff? Um, yeah, I think um, I personally place a lot of emphasis on intuition, um, driving um, how I do physics. Um, and part of the reason for that is, I mean, my mind is a real physical system. And I think, you know, it, it kind of has an idea of how it exists that I am not consciously aware of, right? And so part of my job as a physicist is to kind of bring the, especially studying life, bring the features that are, you know, exist in me as a physical system into the, like a, a way that we can understand it at sort of the level that we're, you know, we're all on the same page, we're consciously aware of it. There's, you know, like ways we can exchange that information between us. Um, and, you know, right now we're not there. And I think part of the thing that intuition is really important, I think a lot, if you look historically at like the history of physics, a lot of sort of the great breakthroughs in physics were driven by people's intuition, which was often contrary to sort of the leading ideas of the day. Um, but the, the idea, but you have to structure your intuition with critical feedback, right? So your intuition, I think, is sort of um, like the... Um, uh, you know, like the lighthouse in the distance or something, and you're trying to let it guide you, but you're still not, you're not going to like hit the rocks on the way there or something. You have to actually navigate based on how reality actually works. Um, and I think where people kind of, um, in my mind, fall astray, like are led astray is if they, if they replace their intuition with mathematics, which happens a lot in sort of people that study mathematical modeling and mathematical theory. So they let the math tell them how reality works. Um, but really, it needs to be a, a sort of co-creation between your intuition and the mathematics, right? And probably your intuition first and then formalization after. And the other one is to just sort of blindly believe everything that the minds that came before have established, right? So I, it's sort of like a lot of scientists acknowledge that um, scientific knowledge is a moving target, right? It changes over time. Um, and obviously, you don't want to scrape everything that came before because it all works, um, but the question is, does it work for the current problems? And if it doesn't, how long do you hold on to it? And I feel like in physics, um, you know, there's kind of this like, there's like this intellectual drag that's really weird. It seems to like happen every hundred years or so where people think physics is mostly complete and therefore we should just apply current theories to everything else. Um, and I find that really deeply mystifying because like, I, I remember when I was an undergrad, like, you know, you go into physics class and people are like, uh, talking about how at the end of the 1800s, people thought physics was complete. Um, and isn't that hilarious? Because look how much we learned in the 1900s. Yet in those same physics departments, it's like, oh yeah, this, we have the standard model and the standard model tells us everything about reality and we're almost at a unified theory of everything. And, and you know, there's not really much left to do in physics except build a better, higher energy accelerator. Yet like life and mind are completely like outside of the scope of explanation. So um, so I find, I find that, that kind of ideology weird. And I think, you know, where, where that comes up is actually related to the intuition question, because like my intuition is always just like, it's like screaming at me sometimes, like, this is not right. This doesn't explain this phenomena. So how do we explain this? And, and I think, I think trying to, um, you know, follow that, but be very cognizant of when to, uh, when to follow it and when to not is really important and, and being in tune with that. Um, but I, th I think it's really important for the creative process also is to follow your gut, so to speak. <laughs>
Yeah, I feel like it's quite crazy how intuition actually works within human beings um, yes. and how it guides us in general. Um, I so I have one last question for you, which is about okay. alien life, because um, I haven't thought a lot about it. Um, but when I, whenever I think about it, it's always very confusing because it seems just so um, like sci-fi, let's say. Um, that we've always been told that there might be an alien life and we always watch these movies and like tv shows but when you actually sit down with a paper and a pen and start to think about like how alien life might actually exist or like evolve yeah. outside of earth how would that happen so i was wondering like how do you think about alien life emerging or how would we if we do yeah. you know emerge like uh, get to see this alien life if we ever do yeah. So, um, so being someone that, you know, is deeply in love with theoretical physics and things, I never thought I'd be that into chemistry, um, or at least I didn't really like it very much early on. And I never thought like molecules are particularly interesting, but I think this is one of the re your question is exactly why I'm studying in some sense, or like trying to validate and think through the theories of what life is in the space of possible molecules. Um, because it's tractable there. And I can talk about these questions kind of meaningful ways. Whereas if you think about the space of all possible technologies, if you're talking about looking for aliens like us and you wanna think about things that are more technological, I mean, that space is so exponentially huge and you can't even articulate it. So the way I think about it is, um, you know, you have a planet, it has some chemistry happening on it. That chemistry starts evolving, whatever evolution is, like the more general principles of evolution. And then the question is how divergent, based on how divergent the geochemical conditions are on those planets, if it does transition into this, into information being the dominant physics or assemblyness, you know, being the dominant physics, um, how much divergence do you get at what scales of reality? So I think, um, you know, we don't even know if alternative chemistries for life are possible, although I would conjecture that they definitely are. So I think even at the scale of having minimal living systems or even systems on their way to life, you're going to get a significant amount of divergence on where you are in the huge combinatorial space of possible chemistries that the universe could cause to exist. Then you think, oh, you know, the chemistry is already different enough. Where is it going to go from there when you get to like things like cellular life or uh, multicellular life or societies or technologies like the, you know, the spot possibility space of each of those layers gets larger and larger and larger. And, um, and so the divergence would be greater and greater. And so I think it gets a lot harder to think about that because we haven't even done step one to talk about what is the divergence at the level of molecules. Um, and just to give you like a size perspective, I think, um, you know, uh, I think there's like estimates for like small molecules, like, you know, I talked about amino acids being the, uh, you know, uh, the, um, uh, you know, units in a protein. Um, if you if you take all the molecules that are about like I think uh, 600 or 500 Daltons or less, so about the size of two amino acids, um, uh, roughly, there's like 10 to the 60 possible molecules with with like basic elements, um, which is huge. I mean, it's like it's like really huge. Um, you can't possibly make all of the molecules that are even small molecules exist in our universe with all the resources in the universe. So people think like the physical size of the universe is large, but they don't think about the fact that even just thinking about what molecules could be possible for us to build on earth is vastly exceeding, even for small molecules, what our capacity to actually create things is. Um, and that's at the scale of molecules, not at the scale of like cell phones or people or you know, things like that. So, um, so I think it becomes, yeah. So this is probably why it's difficult for us to imagine what the possibilities are, because I think intuitively we know that space is so exponentially huge. We can't actually decide where to grab the, the, the sort of, where's the scaffold to even imagine which part of that space we're in. Yeah, like whenever I imagine it's usually very hard, but um, I, I keep on doing that because I feel like imagination is a really good tool. Um, yeah. and, and intuition as well as we were talking about before um, to like at least like formulate theories and like go about it. Um, I have a huge hope. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I have huge hope um, in finding alien life if there is any. Um, so let, uh, let's see like on, on that note, thank you so much for uh, coming okay. on and talking. It was an immense pleasure because I got to learn so much uh, and especially about like the Boolean network that I was like so confused about and the information <laughs> theory. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for explaining that and coming on the podcast. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for having me.
sehr 